Festive. All right. Hello, all you crazy people out there. My name is Dragon Knight, and welcome back to Harvest December. Uh, Kohai Toyama climbed the snowy mountain with a stuffed rucksack on his back. Since he got, since he was out of shape, he almost got out of breath. But knowing Mizuho was walking right behind him made him put on a put on a strong face. Hey, Onichan, are you already tired? Oi! Think about how many bottles I'm carrying in my bag before you diss me. Kohai was looking forward to spending some relaxing, spending some time relaxing after the patrol after the patrol team broke up. But he dragged out, but he dragged out, but he was dragged out to carry rations up to Tagami Shrine in preparation for the New Year party. Masaki san carried several beer cases up. Then why didn't you ask Masaki to do everything? Because he did four laps and decided his back was sore. Mizuho was truly relentless. Oh, never mind. Kohai adjusted the shoulder straps and cutting into his flesh. He hadn't spent much time without with Mizuho since she had been out on patrol all the time. And so he decided to help her with the party preparations today. Can you hurry up? The sun's going down. Don't complain when I'm helping you. Uh, there you go, being so bad-tempered again. Even Masaki-san was a lot better. Why do you keep bringing him up to compare me with? To compare to compare with me? No, I'm not. I'm comparing him. I'm not comparing him to you, Oni-chan, who is definitely going to need another year to practice to prepare for the entrance exams. Mizuho, you know you aren't any better yourself. And even if you got me to carry all the stuff up here, up there, you know that nobody is going to show up for your party this year. <sighs> Mizuho looked uncomfortable, and Kohai almost made another scathing remark. Come on, let's go. But instead he stopped himself, chastising himself for his ugly state of mind. It's not as if things are going to be any better by venting by going to get any better by venting my frustrations on you. Oni chan, I'm sorry. There were siblings with similar traits. The two arrived at the shrine earlier than expected. The wind was still, but now that Tagami's weather was unpredictable, they stayed cautious. Let's put the things all let's put the things away and hurry back. Okay. Mizuho had no complaints this time. There was a there was a large mound of snow by the entrance. Mizuho stuffed the vegetables they had brought they had, the ve stuffed the vegetables they had brought into it. It was her natural fridge and her way of making her own landmark. What about the drinks? We can't have bottles freeze, they may crack. Can you carry it inside? Mizuho stayed busy said, Mizuho said busily without looking back. Kohai was eager to get the weight off his shoulders. Literally too, he thought to himself. I was hoping Misaki would come. Mikami-sama. Kohai put his rucksack down on the floor. Hey, I'm done outside. I've come to... Huh? Last time you came with Misaki. Misaki sounds overused his body. What am I supposed to make out of that? Why are you, why are you looking for Misaki? Kohai asked. This is going to take a while for me to explain. No, it's not. Mikami said. Yuki might have a miscarriage, Mizuho blanched. To put it nicely, I won't go into the details, thank you. She's... she's in danger? She's hanging in there for now, but I can't guarantee things will get better. That's why you're asking for Misaki. Yes. Just his presence will stabilize her. That's difficult. I know. Both of them are stubborn and have a weird way of thinking. And they have a weird way of thinking. Kohai noticed that he was quite calm despite the unfortunate news. He was surprised, but somewhere, somewhere inside him he had rationalized that anything could be possible when gods came into the equation. It would be a waste of time to ask why. The important part was to know what measures had to be taken. As Mikami had said, it would be difficult to get Misaki to stay by Yuki's side. Misaki thought of Yuki and all, all the time. Misaki thought of Yuki all the time, but he had his reasons he was not there. That's why that's what he was good at, reasoning, and Kohai knew it would be hard to convince him. We have no time to waste. We'll kidnap him if we need to. I agree. But how are we going to get him here? Well, that's obvious. Yeah. Two looked at each other and then gave Kohai a pointed stare. Huh? Me? Kohai pointed at himself. I see. Yuki's in danger. Kohai had come directly to Misaki's house in the shrine after being urged to do so by the two women. He had been explaining the situation to Misaki the moment he stepped into his room. Misaki wore a frown for a while, but soon relaxed his expression. Are you trying to think of a reason why you shouldn't go? Kohai asked as he studied Misaki. He seemed unfazed. I'm going, I'm going, but not now. Why? Don't you see it's an emergency? I need more time to prepare. Kohai didn't understand what Misaki was saying. He had just explained that Yuki's life was in danger and that she could suffer a miscarriage. 
You thought it would do. It, you thought it would be right. You thought it would be the right thing to do if Masaki dropped everything and ran to her now, but Masaki wasn't budging. I'm beginning to wonder if I should knock you out and carry you to her. Please don't. It's your job to save her now. What preparations are you talking about? He was right, wasn't he? But Masaki was looking so sure of himself, Kohai began to doubt himself. Well, let's say I went to Yuki and she becomes alright. What? This isn't the time to- Kohai shut his mouth. He wouldn't begin to quarrel. When Misaki spoke slowly and seemed aloof, he was... That was when he was ready, really gathering his thoughts. She becomes stable and I'm... Because I'm there. And the child is born safely. Very good. That's good, right? Yeah. Kohai nodded. And what comes after? Kohai couldn't answer. She'll toss, she'll toss me out again, climb down the mountain with the child, and everybody says stays separate. Everything remains broken. I'm not so sure about that myself, but alright. Kohai almost staggered beneath Misaki's unwavering gaze. Kohai, do you really think that it's alright to have everything end that way? No, I don't. He was beginning he was being led on by Misaki's reasoning again, Kohai knew, but still, it was his honest answer. The future Misaki described was something Kohai feared. Why where had they all made a mistake? Or were they in this situation now because they were too afraid to, to make mistakes? Thinking philosophically wasn't his forte. I know what you're trying to say. That's not the future I want. In fact, it's what I dread. It's not like I want Yuki to raise the child alone. But won't it be worse that the child dies? That's what I'm saying. I'll go. But just not yet. So you aren't going to make her suffer till she can't really make. So you're going to make her suffer till she can't really make take it anymore. I know it sounds terrible. Kohai could. Kohai couldn't still understand Masaki. He seemed to be alright with the idea that Yuki was in pain. He felt his blood boiling, his head heating up his, to the point where his, thought his temples would burst. I should hit him now, punch him. So you're trying to make this, to, you're trying to do this for Yuki, to put everything back to normal. Then Kohai held his breath. What would happen after Yuki and Shira had their children? The blizzards would stop, the wolves would go back to the mountains, peace would return to Tagami, everyone would live, their, everyone lives happily ever after. In an ideal world, what would happily ever after be? There would be... Yuki and Misaki together. And are you serious? I still need time to prepare, though. Misaki Kono was out of his mind. You're being too idealistic, right? You know you're being idealistic, right? Is that a bad thing? Kohai finally gave in. I'm okay. Misaki hey. Kono liked things that were unreal. He had always repeatedly said that reality was merciless. And now he was trying to bend the reality to his own will. In his ideal world, his vision... I'm glad you stopped by, Kohai. There was something I had to ask of you two. Included a future of Kohai and Sine, too. The 24th of December. It was easy to remember that it w what day it was by looking at the faces around him. Some people looked happy, some people looked lonely. The school bell rang to signal the day was over. It also signaled the beginning of Kohai's mission. Kohai was feeling down. He turned his head to sideways to hide it. He thought about his little sister. The, unusual, the usual morning gathering had ended with a speech from the student council. As usual, she read off the paper in her hands, sometimes making mistakes, sometimes stammering. I don't like Dragonite. Usually there was a few laughs, a few knowing glances. Today, nothing. Not even a single giggle. I guess that was inevitable. The students gossiped perhaps Mizuho had eaten something wrong and to lose her sunny disposition. But Kohai knew the reason was that she was depressed. She hadn't received any replies for the New Year party. Misaki and Mayoi had agreed that the party was a good idea at most. Mizuho was doing the best she could, but she couldn't but she wouldn't be rewarded for it. Kohai himself had spent sent his reply to her from his cell phone telling her he wouldn't participate this year. He felt ashamed he couldn't even tell her face to face. Sane stood up from her chair with the help from her crutches. Kohai knew she took her time leaving class because right after school the bell the, right after the school bell the corridors were crowded. She walked with a limp, her sh left shoulder higher than her other. Uh, she took bigger strides with her left foot to make up for the other leg she couldn't move, wouldn't move. She was b getting better at walking, getting better at using her crutches. She was adapting to her uncomfortable situation. Damn it! Kohai realized he said that often now. The weird thing was that he didn't even know what he was cursing at. He turned around. Misaki Kono was looking at the window in a daze. A stack of printouts and his report card still laid on his desk. When are you going to bring Misaki to us? Every day, Mikami sent a message. Misaki never relented. He simply said he needed more time to prepare and didn't bother explaining at all. 
For some reason, Kohai didn't feel it was right to explain to Mikami about Masaki's plans. Maybe it was because he felt there was no excuse when Yuki and the child's life was put in the balance. He wouldn't tell her. Nobody would ask for a reason anyway. They are too busy thinking about their own reasons. This is bad. There were only a few people left in the classroom now. Apart from Masaki and Kohai, the other people looked happy, eager to get their dates that evening. Get on, get on to their dates that evening. Masaki finally turned his head to look at Kohai. Kohai fought back the urge to look away. They stared at each other quietly for a stretch of time. Masaki had said he needed time to prepare. He needed to prepare. His friends had scattered, and none of them were smiling. Even if Yuki came back with her child, who who could truly celebrate? Masaki was saying that it was impossible. And now he was trying to reach out for the stars. He needed us, but everyone at this He needed us, everyone to be at their best to welcome Yuki and Shiro home. Us. That meant him, Kohai Toyama, too. Was that ideal? What was ideal? Whatever. Misaki softened his expression a little. Strangely, Kohai knew what he meant. Misaki made his own preparations. Now he needed to prepare now he needed the people around him to do their best. Which meant Oh alright, Kohai mouths back. Misaki nodded encouragingly. He didn't know if he would work, if it would work, but he would give it his best shot. He scooped up the sports bag by his feet and lifted it as a signal. I'm going. Good luck. He almost made a smart remark back, but Kohai decided he didn't need as much luck as he could get. The skies were turning gray outside. Snow was beginning to fall. Kohai's ears hurt from the cold just by stepping outside of the classroom. He walked through the quiet corridor, listening to his footsteps. Just a half a year ago, Sine was determined about the path she wanted to walk. Unlike himself, who had chosen to study for the entrance exams because he was unsure what he wanted to do. Now, Sine had come home from a dead end. Sine had come to a dead end. Her bright future had darkened, and Kohai had stopped studying entirely. He was still unsure as ever. Still unsure of what he was doing, Kohai made his way to Sine. He felt like a pilgrim, simply walking to a destination believing it would grant him salvation. There would be a, a chilled bucket of water waiting for him. Whatever Yumi threw at him, literally, he didn't feel the cold first, but instead his skin would itch from the stinging sensation. He could imagine it now, and his skin crawled just from the thought. Maybe he could get one of those radioactive suits that protected him against everything. At least it would save him from catching a cold or catching pneumonia or something that would inevitably happen if he continued his pilgrimage. As if it would mean something that I was only... As if it would mean something if I was the only one that stayed healthy, Kohai thought as about what he had just said. What if he protected himself, stayed healthy, and stayed safe? Just him. That was the question... That question was what it... The question was what was in it for him after all that. Nothing. I just realized there's no sound playing again. Say hello to the Windows Audio Mixer. Alright. God. I don't know why my 3DS capture application automatically mutes itself when I turn it on. And I was just kind of running on autopilot there. Really annoying. Anyway, nothing. Maybe it didn't make any sense to anybody else except for people like Misaki. But to Kohai, it was now clear as day. Every day, he would go to Sine knowing he would risk his health. Knowing there was a risk to his health. He would get a cold bucket of water thrown at him routinely and circle the days of the calendar after he paid a visit. By now, he didn't know whether he had done something to prove he had done something or if it was just a record of his failure. Yet he continued going every day. It was because he believed something, even for a little. It was because he believed something, even for a little, would change, his, would change from his efforts. Even so, knowing he would be unwelcome caused him to drag his feet. It was strange how he managed to keep moving forward despite that. It suits you walking in with your head down. Don't ignore us, you guys. What a coincidence. Yeah, a coincidence. It was Mayori and Sakura. So they haven't given up on the idea. Yori said with a scowl, as she glared at the piece of paper placed it on the door that read closed today. What do you mean? What idea? Just talking about Yumi Marino's escape route. Now, Senpai, you've got work to do. Go in, get your ablution done. Ab ablution done. That was a word I'm not familiar with. Uh, you make it sound like some kind, of si some kind of sacred ritual. It doesn't look like you're gained any sort of blessing from it, though. You're right. He did a few stretches and ran a little on the spot, the same way swimming athletes warm up before they entered the pool. 
Then he took a step back to brace himself. Right. Kohai was just about to reach out and open the door. To hell with you! Huh? The door opened by itself. Before anybody knew what was going on, Yumu Murino had tossed the contents of her bucket with great vigor. I decided to save you some time coming in since I'm chasing you out anyway. Hey! She had lifted one leg up, ready to kick him away, but she froze. Two girls. Ah, true! Sakura sneezed like a man. There was a rhythmic chattering to Miyura's teeth. So cold, so cold it hurts. I'm getting sleepy, I don't feel the cold is bad anymore. Yuri-chan, don't start the dying process. This calls for Mission Sakura Body Heat. I have to hug you, but oh, the disappointment that your girl makes me wonder if this is really necessary. Uh. Kohai wiped the water dripping off his brow on his sleeve. He was cold, but because he was ready for it, it wasn't so bad to him. He surmised that he was adapting to a bad situation too. Hey, both of you. What? Here. Towels. Here. A dryer. Here. A Cairo. And here. A blanket. He quickly shoved the usual items into his hands. You're well prepared. Some guy taught me how to do this. He then turned to Yumi, who was still in shock. You aren't going to chase out two freezing girls, are you? Is this part of your plan? Yumi glared at Kohai. You're the one that decided to open the door and throw water before I went in. Explain to me, how could I plan that? Uh... Yumi fell silent. It was a small victory for Kohai. They, sat, they all sat amidst the low hum of the clothes dryer. Miyori and Sakura sipped on their hot tea after straightening their slightly wrinkly clothes. Why not add mine, to, add mine in the lot as well? Makes no difference. Kohai, you're the type of guy whose laundry woman insists gets washed separately from theirs. Because Kohai wasn't allowed to use the clothes dryer, he had to use the hair dryer instead. Several areas of his clothing still remained moist and clammy. Would you like more tea? Yes, please! Sakura lifted her cup with both her hands reverently. After Yumi filled it th with steaming green tea, she warmed her palms with it and began sipping at it again. Yumi would brew another fresh batch, and Kohai and the others would either accept a refill or say they had enough for the meantime. That was the only conversation that had been going on for that was the only conversation that had been going on for a while. Uh, now what? Surprisingly, it was Yumi that lost her patience. Aren't you going to say something? You came here for a reason, didn't you? What is it? She was right to be annoyed. She also seemed nervous, too, because she filled a cup of rice wine just for herself and quickly drank it in one mouthful. <clears throat> but, I don't think I can start a pleasant conversation in a heavy mood like this. Well then why don't we all just sit here and drink tea till we get bloated? I have a reason why I haven't started speaking, because the person that has to start the conversation is sitting right beside me. Miyori was right to be annoyed, too. Kohai felt like shooting a dark look in her defense, uh, at her in defense. It suppressed the feeling. He knew he had to say something. That was why he had come to do every day. Now that he had managed to come this far, what was he supposed to say? You came again to do your spiritual. Stu to you, you came again to do your stupid ritual, huh? Yumi said as she walked out of the kitchen with a cup and a bottle of rice wine in her hands. She sat down by the counter seats where they were, and just like that, Kohai felt intimidated. Yeah, I've come to do my stupid ritual again. He was thankful, however, that she had started the conversation because he was finding it difficult to start it himself. He was ashamed. Sine's in her room. She doesn't come out anymore other than to eat or go to the bathroom. I think it's your fault. But you can't deny Sine Senpai's leg was injured by accident. Are you sticking up for him? Yumi glared at Mayori. I'm just stating the facts. I thought I'd really give you a hard time today, so you'd never come back. And what do you do? You bring all these girls. You look like you're having fun. Wait! We followed him without his knowing. That's not Kohai Senpai's fault. I know that. Yumi lifted a weak hand up, stopping Sakura from speaking further. I know that. I know even the Kohai isn't that bad. I'm just frustrated. I can't help it. I know I shouldn't say it, but I have to. But I just do. Forgive me. Yumi poured another glass of rice wine. The surface of the liquid swelled and... Um... We're leaving Tagami Town, no matter what. It spilled over. I don't even need to wait for Sane to graduate. We could leave at the end of the month. We'll leave. Your exodus doesn't look like it'll work well for you, though. What are you saying? You know the story when Moses leads the people of Israel across the Red Sea, which would be capitalized, saving them by taking them to Mount Sinai? Except in your case, you aren't saving anybody. Quite the contrary, you're trying to make your daughter's life a living hell. You! Putting your measly bit of land on sale isn't even working, is it? Think about it logically. 
Who in his right mind would buy a small piece of land in the countryside with a harsh climate these days? Do I really have to say it out loud for you to understand? Yumi was so angry that she was speechless. She gripped her cup with such force that it looked like it could shatter. You know it's the best decision to stay in Tagami. Why are you so reluctant to take Mashiro Tawada's help? Maybe you feel like you will never be able to pay her back. But still, is it so humiliating for you to receive help from a friend? Yusuji! You're going to deny your friend because of your stupid pride? I... I... Yumi burst into tears with her face in her hands. I just want everything to be normal. Uh, if Mashiro helps me, it... It won't be normal anymore. You can't avoid change. This is just an option. This is just an opinion from a high school kid. If an adult like you decides to do something, there's no way I can stop you. But I will say this once. Yuri sighed. Tagami needs this place. T Tagami needs Sane. The shaking of Yumi's shoulders stopped. What do you want to do, Kohai? That was the end of the conversation about the present. You came to talk about Sane, right? Talk to Sane, right? What do you intend to do? Now that they had started, now they had started a conversation about the future. Yumi didn't reply to Miyuri's statement. She appeared to be confused, still pondering if Miyuri had, still pondering the point Miyuri had raised. Pushing her own questions aside, she had asked Kohai her question. I came to talk. That's what I'm going to do. Kohai answered, knowing it wasn't what she wanted to hear. That's, that's it. The truth was that he didn't know what the right answer was. He could apologize, or he could reason with her. There was no, there were so many things he could say, but none of that seemed right when he tried to put it into words. I know you aren't kidding around, but I can't help let you see her when you're... What are you doing? Miura sighed. I was going to keep quiet, but it looks like I don't even have the luxury of that. I don't know if I've said anything wrong. I don't think I've said anything wrong. You haven't, but nobody is going to approve of your actions, especially Sakura and I. Miura gave him a hard, cold look. Do you know what day it is today? It's Christmas Eve. Didn't you notice how all the students at school were excited and happy? She ground her teeth angrily. I was waiting for you to ask me out for the day, for the entire night yesterday. I've always I'm always the one asking you out, so I thought maybe so I thought maybe Christmas. Maybe Christmas you would make a move. Kohai felt like going down on his knees. Goat washed over him. Mayori, I'm sorry. You're apologizing. That's all I can do. If you apologize, that means you acknowledge that you forgot about Mayuri-chan and that your thoughts were entirely coming out to see Marino senpai Sakura stood up from her chair angrily. Sakura knows why I'm mad at you. Was she always talking in third person, or did I just notice that now? I think she was. Kohai senpai, give me an answer. Tell me why you're here, or convince me that you have the reason to be here even when you've chosen me. What was he thinking? Kohai thought, surprised that it had never hit him before. He felt like it was his duty to come here every day because he felt responsible for Sine's injury. But at the same time, he had responsibilities responsibilities to Miyori too. It was his duty as her boyfriend to think about her and ask her out at least on Christmas. Why now? Why today? Why didn't he think whether why didn't he think whether it was right or wrong? He had forgotten about Miyori. No, he hadn't forgotten about Miyori, he had simply put Sine on priority. Whichever it was, he was a cad. And things got even worse. Hey. He realized the reason why he was both there was the reason why he was there was a mixture of both. He hadn't forgotten about Moyori, but pretended that he had so he could visit Sane. He hated himself for that. I'm sorry. Who asked for an apology? I'm asking you. Is it me or is it her? I'm sorry. He wouldn't. He would take any punishment now. The only thing he could do now is bow his head. Kohai Senpai, that's unfair. You owe Moyori Chan an answer. I do. He felt like it had been ages since he heard his own voice. You're right, Sakura. Then... But all I can say now is that I'm sorry. That's unfair. You're not going to give her a straight answer. After Mayura chan has given you a chance. How is she going to feel, being left out in the cold like that? You ass. Kohai almost laughed at himself. How low he had sunk. Well, the experiment was a failure, Mayuri said. Even I couldn't change things. No, because it was me. Because it was me, things didn't change, Mayuri said. I had underestimated you. I thought you were weak. Because you were weak, a serious relationship with Marina Senpai would be a burden to you. So I'd adjusted myself to you. And so I'd adjust myself to you. And you'd have someone to and you'd have someone just right. And this is what happens. You just became someone that needed nodded to my every word without trying to do anything to sustain the relationship, Yuri said. 
Senpai, do you know what you take up? Senpai, do you know why you take up my offer? When you said Marino Chan was. Ah. Wrong suffix. When you said Marino Senpai was too heavy, and you found her a burden, the truth is you didn't mind the weight of her at all. But what happens when people get tired a bit? When something that was normal becomes heavy because they've held on to it for too long? What do people do? You didn't went. You didn't want to listen to the rest of it. You can you let go of what you have and carry something lighter. In other words, you used me as your break. Ah! Kohai wanted to shout, No, that's not true. But he couldn't deny the truth of it. Yet he couldn't agree. Because if he did, he would truly hurt Miyori. That's what it was, a break. You needed a rest because before you could carry something heavy again. What wasn't expected was that Marina Senpai would get injured and her weight as a burden would get heavier than before. Find something light enough to you find something light enough you can carry. If not, you just get crushed by the weight of what you want to bear. By the weight you want to bear, Kohai remembered Yukari Nakahiri's words. He had thought she was right. Something heavy was a burden. Life was hard. He had imagined finding something just right would solve his problems, so he decided to take Mayori's offer. But it didn't solve anything. Ever since you started dating me, you become a doormat. You just agree to everything I say and look depressed. It makes no difference whether you're dead or alive at all. He had thought, but he didn't have it in him to carry the burden. And what had he done? He had gone back to Sine every day to get a cold bucket of water dumped on him. So he got a cold bucket of water thrown on him. Every single day. If he hated being in a tough position so much, he could have run away. Was it the opposite then? Was it that he needed the weight? He needed something heavy to ground him. To ground him. He now knew that he had it in him to carry something heavy all his life. If it was just that sometimes people get tired. They needed to rest sometimes. I couldn't stand it because you were just right. I suppose that's the case. Miyori stood up from her seat and sniffed. Whichever it was, I'm not done with I'm done with you. I don't need a piece of crap like you. I wasn't a failure, you were. As a human being. Miyori, goodbye. Why don't you go to that one legged woman and pathetically lick, lick each other's wounds? She walked out the she walked out and shut the door. Miyori chan Sakura went after her. Senpai, you do you know what to do. Before she left, she spun around and gave him a bow. To get and gave a bow. Kohai reached out for his glass of tea slowly. He felt numb. Oh. It was only after he had picked up his cup that he realized his hands were trembling. He was thirsty, but his foggy mind was sh and shaky hands wouldn't let him do what he needed. It took great effort for him to squeeze the cup firmly in his hand to drink the tea that had gone cold. It's bitter. Well, we've both got what we deserved, Yumi said as she lay her face flat down on the counter. I can't believe you're dating such a clever girl. Was dating. I just got dumped. You don't seem that turn up about it. Did you expect this would happen? No, I think it's fi because I finally know what I want to do. So you, so what are you going to do? Oh, great. Kohai has reached Nirvana. I'm going to talk with Sine. That's the same answer as I'll find something in there. I'm going out for some fresh air, Yumi said, and she walked out of the shop. Yumi-san. She answered by closing the door. This is still going, huh? We're almost at a half hour. Yumi Marino walked back into the snow and turned back to view her small, shabby shop. For over ten years since her husband died, she had managed to keep his legacy running. It's in shambles. Just by giving it a once-over, she could find the many areas that needed fixing and could do with improvement. Water. Alright, in the winter, the wind would get through the crevices in the old building and the rooms would freeze over. In summer, it was so hot they didn't need to use the clothes dryer. But it was still her life. It was, life, it was what she centered her life around. The sun was setting. Usually, she would put, she would be putting up banners outside now, getting ready to open for the evening. She never knew what the town was like during this time. Maybe she would take a walk, she thought. You too. She stopped her tracks. Why do I have to judge these two and hurt them and punish them? This is so stupid. Mayuri chan you did good. You did what you came to do. You followed through your, your plan. Mayuri looked like she, looked like the strong-willed tough girl that shot them down. She had her head hung down and her shoulders were shaking. Um, I didn't mean to spy on you. I'm sorry, I was pretty harsh back there. You're Mayuri chan right? It was harsh, but it was good medicine. I can't believe someone like you chose Kohai to date. I was blind. Um, how is Kohai senpai? Sakura asked. Hmm. Yumi turned back. She looked at Sine. Do you think he'll manage? I don't care whether he does or not. Those two can rot for all I know. I see. 
Amy pondered for a moment and closed her eyes, feeling that the last of her doubts fade away. Would they reach the answer she hoped for? She knew she was being idealistic, but there was no harm in making a wish. Hey, let me take you guys out for a treat. It probably won't be as wonderful as my cooking, but let's find something good to eat. She took out her cell phone and dialed a number from her address book. Have you decided to stay in Tagami? Hey, let's go out for a drink. I've got two other guests with me, too. I'll reserve seats for you at my restaurant. Yumi, is everything alright? I'm not sure yet. Yumi stretched her arm out. But we'll manage with help. I had hoped you'd ask for some help sooner, Yumi. I'm sorry. And I, I should have asked sooner. And thanks, Mashiro. She, cl she clutched hold of the paper bag stuck, paper stuck on the door, reading out of business, and tore it away. This is still going. Kohai snapped out of his daze after hearing the bang of the door. What was that? He ran out of the shop and looked around, but nobody was there. It was beginning to snow, and it was so quiet he couldn't figure out where the sounds came from. Oh. But then he saw three figures in the distance walking away. He thought to call out to them, but then stopped. If they intended to wait for him, they wouldn't be leaving. Unsure what was going on, he decided it might be better to stay inside and wait for Yumi's return. Oh. He turned back to find an answer. He closed the door. There on the door was the wrinkly out-of-business paper struck backwards and scri with scribbles all over. It was just two phrases. Oh man. The first said, temporarily closed. I guess it's up to me now. The second phrase was written in force. It said, do whatever the hell you want. Yumi, Miyori, and Sakura. Kohai walked up the narrow, dark wooden staircase. With each step he took, the planks squeaked. He was familiar with the sound and it reassured him that he was indeed in the Merino house. It was home that he was. It was a home that he had knew as well as his own, back when he was smaller. He, he saw a scratch on the pair of wooden pillars, and it reminded him exactly how this was made, how that was made. He turned and reached. He turned once he reached the second floor. It was an old house, so the door was a flattering fissuma. Covered with cardboard, all right. Around the height of his knees, there was a, a patch of paper struck out and struck stuck on the door that covered a hole. The frame was slightly bent. Kohai had broken it, pretending to be a kung fu master when he was little. He made Sine cry, and Yumi got angry with him. He hadn't made much progress since then. He was still doing the same old thing. He took a deep breath to steady himself. Kohai, Sine called out in a faint voice. How did you know it was me? You're the only one that climbs stairs like you're the only one that climbs the stairs, skipping a step. You can tell by my footsteps. You must have been a ninja in your previous life. Don't come in. The Fusuma door didn't have a key. I've got to talk to you. Kohai said slowly of where he could enter if he wanted to. I don't have anything to say. I'm moving away soon anyway. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You probably won't be moving away, you know? A silence. I guess you couldn't hear everything, huh? I can't believe Mom changed her mind. Hey, I'm going to go stay here forever. I'm not going to stay here forever. I'm coming in. He said it lightly, but it was so nervous, his hands were as stiff as he pulled the door open. I told you not to come in. There on the bed, Sine was curled up in a ball in her blanket. Without moving from her position, she lifted her head to glare at him. I had to. If you're awake, why not turn on the lights? It's dark in here. Don't. He was about to turn on the lights on, but stopped. Please keep it this way. She shifted around, pulling on her blanket. Alright. Sorry if I step on anything. She was trying to hide her legs. Why are you here? You see, you convinced Yumi-sama to stay. Really? She didn't hey. seem surprised. Kohai sat down on the floor. Did you manage to hear what was going on downstairs? Not really. You guys weren't talking that loud, and my room has a soundproof mat on the floor. I didn't know that. You haven't come up here in a long time. When was the last time you think you visited? Kohai tried to reply, but realized he wasn't confident about his answer. It's been a while since we've had a talk one-on-one. -on -one. Well, we haven't really been alone. It's been pretty crowded, huh? I thought life would go on peacefully at the slow pace we were used to. Everything's changed since Misaki kun came. Yeah, because of Misaki, everything's become so complicated. They grumbled, but they were laughing. Did you come here to talk about the past? I just got dumped by Mayuri. Eh! Sine leaned forwards. She said she didn't want to date a piece of crap that wouldn't even ask his girlfriend out on Christmas Eve. How true, that. Sine didn't move an inch. She looked as if she had forgotten how to breathe. Kohai waited for her to absorb the situation. It's... it's my fault, she finally whispered. I knew you'd say that. 
So I thought I'd convince you otherwise, but then I realized we'd, we'd just stubbornly insist that it's our fault. So that so now I'll just say it's your fault. Hey, that's unfair. Let's say it's my fault, all right? He asked. Tane stayed silent. Anyway, Miura dumped me. Is that why you've come for me? Tane pouted. Her cheeks inflated like a chipmunk. Hey, I'm not going to be that convenient, other woman. Yeah, I know that. Hey, don't make that face as if to say, then why did you come here? But why did you? If you knew... I'm making my own preparations for an idealistic world. What is that supposed to mean? Tane was right to look confused. I'll explain later, it's a bit long. I'll just say things will probably play out the way you wanted to. Tane kept quiet. She knew him so well that, he knew, that she knew he meant to say something further. She was waiting to listen. Tane was right before him now. He just had to say it. I'm nervous, but I have to do this, Kohai told himself. What are you going to talk about, Yumi had asked. He didn't have a proper answer then. It was strange, just how sitting before her, Kohai's words were slowly taking shape. In June and October. That's that's when we made a promise, and, we, and we'd find an answer by winter. That, that we'd find an answer by winter. His breath missed the cold, dark room they were in. Kohai touched his frozen ears. They felt numb, not quite itchy, but not quite painful. <clears throat> Water break. I've gone through half a bottle already in just this chapter alone. Yeesh. Anyway. <clears throat> As he warmed his ears, he became aware that the windows were, were clattering. The hinges were loose, and he remembered Sine complaining long ago that, the wind was that when the wind was strong, the window didn't protect her from the cold outside at all. Since long ago, Kohai didn't remember the last time he had come to Sine's room. He knew he, he he knew during secondary school he only visited the shop, and now he was right before her. Sine wanted Kohai quietly. Sine watched Ko Kohai. Sine watched Kohai quietly from her bed. She simply waited. It would be easier for her, her to shout at him, berate him, to invent her anger on him, but she didn't. If she got angry now. There would be so much less they could do. Offense and defense, anger and apologies. But Sine and Marina wouldn't allow that. She demanded more. Hey. Kohai felt as, as if he could be crushed by a single word. He rocked his body forwards and backwards, trying to pretend he was alright. He looked up at Sine. Her face was cast in shadow. Her jaw moved slightly, and Kohai took it as a permission to speak. Maybe it wasn't, but he would take it as that anyway. I know this sounds bad, but... He left his words unravel again from the tip of his tongue. Is there supposed to be music here? Because I don't hear anything again. What keeps muting this 3DS capture? It's weird. I didn't do anything that time. Alright, anyway. I never touched you before, Sine. He knew that was a lie now because he had always put it off, never wanting. Never. What does that even mean? Alright, that was random. But he knew that was a lie now because he had always put it off, never saying what he always wanted to say. Um, Sine looked surprised at what he said. But you have. Your surprise look changed to wariness. You picked me up so many times, you know how much I weigh. But I've always needed a purpose to touch you. What are you talking about? If you wanted to touch me for a reason, that would be a crime. I mean, I needed something to justify my, my, myself. The more he talked, the more ashamed he got. He had always made so many excuses. If you, she's too heavy, she's too close, I'm unsure, I need more time. Whenever he made co contact with her, he made he made himself a permission slip with excuses. Because I had to do this to, because I have to do this to help her, because we're friends, because because that's why now he had to ask, Can I touch you now? Context. Kohai Toyama needed Sune Marina to know he wanted purity purely from his heart. It wasn't as if touching her would solve any of their problems. It was a one-sided request, something Sine would gain nothing from. Kohai himself didn't believe his re request would change anything. But he needed to do this. He needed to, to express his wishes. I don't understand. Sine ducked her head. Just that small gesture from Kohai wondering if he was wrong wonder made him Just that small gesture from Kohai made Kohai wonder if he was wrong to ask. Fear swelled up inside him. She suddenly looked far away. I'm not very clever, but when it comes to you, I know a few things. I know you're being serious. Why do you need to touch me? You can punch me later if you want. 
or cut my leg off or whatever you want. He bowed his head down. But please, let me do this. He felt like he could give a million reasons why he wanted to touch her, but he kept them to herself. This is so... I don't want to say wrong, but... Context? Again? As he kept them inside him, they seemed to meld over into one solid reason he could give her, something he didn't want know how she would react to. It was something he knew all along. And now... You know, Kohai... Kohai snapped his head up, surprised at Sine's relaxed response. You look... You look like that desperate guy that he's trying to convince his date to go to a motel with him now. Sine started to laugh. You always make it so hard for me to stay angry with you. So you mean... I'll cut your leg off if you don't do something. Sine gave him a pointed look. One leg probably isn't enough to make up for you for what you've been through. Kohai suddenly realized he felt exuberantly happy. He almost laughed her out loud with her. He said he wanted to touch her. They didn't say where. But Sine understood him. She lifted the edge of her blanket and slowly peeled it back. Don't look. No, I will look. Uh she turned away she turned her head away and pinkened. It wasn't any better. Kohai could imagine how stupid he looked from the heat he could feel radiating off his cheeks. Don't look. From what he saw, his heart tightened and he felt a slight push come uh, and he felt as if the slightest push could shatter him. But he couldn't stop now. I take it this is her leg. That like got bitten off by the wolf. His hand was shaking uncontrollably, but he didn't hesitate. Uh, if he showed her any hesitation now, he would never be able to face Sine again. He touched her. The cold. He traced the surface of her rough scars, the scars he had caused. I mean, he didn't. She ran out of the building on her own and ran into the wolves on her own. But okay. I think it's because blood doesn't circulate well on that leg. Sine's voice brushed against the top of his head. He felt the swollen bumps enter his hands and never and never kept his eyes off the blackened reddish bruises that surrounded his stitches. Sine. His wish had come true. He was touching Sine now. How did he feel? Was his, what was his reason? He hugged her knees to his he hugged her knees to his chest and pressed his forehead against them. Why? His reasons, his mistakes, his hopes. I'm sorry. They all spilled over. I know. Spilled over. I love you. I know. I love you. I knew all along. Now everything was coming out. He said it again and again like an idiot. Sine simply nodded and replied, she knew. Kohai pushed down the choke he could feel constricting his throat. It took an effort to contain his emotion that felt so out of place. He gritted his teeth to stay in control. What should I do? He wasn't going to cry. <clears throat> he wasn't going to cry. If you're asking out of pity, I don't need that. Can I say something that might make you angry? Kohai, you're speaking strangely again. I got influenced by the guy that changed us all. The truth is, I'm kind of glad just a little that you got injured. Hey, I'm going to get mad at you, Sine said, but she didn't look angry. You know, I avoided you saying that you were too heavy for me. I thought being with you would decide my future, that I'd get set on a path that I wasn't ready yet. So you took my Yori Chan's offer. I have to admit, I was enticed by the idea of having a relationship that was just right. It was easy. I even thought I could stay that way forever. And my leg? It made me understand. Or rather, Miura made me think about it just now. It's so unconvincing. He knew it was, but continued. It turns out that I needed something heavy. I needed my life to have burdens. I need something I needed I need something I have to support. Like you and your leg. That you made it just sound like I'm just some charity case, you know? Well, I'm just trying to explain how I came to that conclusion. Of course, everything is because I love you, and, um... The more they spoke, the further they got from what he wanted to say. He was getting tongue-tied, and he couldn't help look Sine in the eye now. Oh, forget it, Kohai. No, but I have to tell you. We both aren't that clever, don't try so hard. Kohai fell silent. It's okay, I know what you're trying to say. Then... But you've gone off with some other girl and only come back after you've been dumped? I can't trust you. Kohai drops his shoulders. Yeah, I know. It muted again. Why? Windows? Um? Why does it do that? Alright. Yeah, I know. I knew that. I knew it, and this would—I knew that this would end this way. I knew it. That's true. I know I deserve it. 
Kohai stammered, his heart cracking. So you have to make up for what you've done. What do you mean? What do you want me to do? First, I need you to go to the second-hand bookshop and get my, my cooking books back. And starting tomorrow, you'll have to follow Mom to the markets early in the morning and shop for the day's ingredients. Then after school, you'll have to come here and learn how to cook with me. I also need to walk. I also need help walking there and back from school. Isn't that a bit too much, Sine San? Ah, my leg hurts. It's so hard not being able to walk. Wow, I wonder why I didn't make that much profit this month. How would I live? How will I live from now? Sine pushed her right leg towards Kohai in an exaggerated manner. You could feel the weight of her. Damn it! It was the most. It was almost unfair how impossible it was for him to deny that. To deny her when she did that. All right. But despite it all, he was bursting with happiness. Fine. I'll make it up to you till you forgive me. Then I'm never going to forgive you. Oh, I lifted both hands in surrender. So I have to go to the second-hand bookstore first, right? Yeah. There's one more thing to do. There's more? You have to support me. But I warn you, I'm a real heavyweight. Leave it to me. Though I, though I have to say. Hmm? For a moment, I take your comment literally. Err, Kohai. She lifted her hand to slap him with a teary, smiling face. Kohai thought he could watch her expressions change forever and felt somewhat shy for thinking something romantic like that. After all these years, Sine's room was filled with her laughter again. Finally, that one's over. God, that went on for 45 minutes. Alright, I'm gonna end this off here. I hope you all enjoy that, because I really need to drink some water. My name is Dragonite. I'm gonna try and find out why this stupid 3DS capture program keeps muting itself, and I will see you all later.